Amen. Well, hey, this morning we are launching into a new teaching series over the next uh, probably about eight weeks. It's going to be it's going to be a little bit of a lengthy series, but it's going to be really good. It's called the fight. How many know we are in a spiritual battle? Okay, talk back to me. We're in a spiritual battle. How many know it? Okay, how many feel the pressure of that fight from time to time? Yes, we are in a spiritual battle. As a pastor, one of the things that tends to frustrate me at times is that God, uh, in His grace to us, has given us everything we need to succeed in this fight. He's given us all the tools that we need to win the battle, and yet so many people, though they're good intentioned, they, they come into the fight saying, I want to win, I want to stand my ground against the enemy, and yet one way or another, he gets the upper hand, and they end up knocked down, and they, and they end up not standing their ground, and it happens time and time and time again. And so what we really want to address here in this series is we want to begin to give you some tools to be more effective in fighting the spiritual fight that we're all in. How many would appreciate some tools to be more effective in fighting the spiritual fight? So that's really what we're, we're going to be about here these next few weeks. This morning we're going to start with a little bit of a history lesson. I'm kind of a history buff. I love history, and in particular I'm, I'm a really interested in World War II history. And so it was the autumn of 1944, and the tide of World War II at this point had turned. Okay, Germany, if you know much about World War II, Germany at one point had basically overtaken pretty much all of Europe, right? They really had a stronghold in, in throughout Europe. And yet by the autumn of 1944, the Allies had successfully landed uh, on the Normandy beach. In fact, we just remembered that earlier this week. June 6th was the remembrance of that. It had successfully landed in Normandy, and by the autumn, they had pressed inland, and France, by this point, was pretty much liberated. Germany was on the run, okay? Germany was on the run, and anybody that was really involved in the situation really kind of could see or identify that that the Allies were going to ultimately win the war. At this point in time, that was sort of a, a foregone conclusion that Germany wasn't going to be able to, to win the war. The Allies were going to win, <laughs> excuse me, and, and they were celebrating. Back in Paris, there was celebrations of liberation and parades are being thrown, and, and there was this sense that the war would be over soon. In fact, the rumor began to spread amongst the Allied forces and amongst the American troops that the war is going to be over by Christmas. We'll be out of here and home by Christmas. There was just one problem. Somebody forgot to inform Germany that the war was over and that they had lost. And so Hitler, in a last-ditch effort to sort of regain control of the situation, he prepared his final offensive, and they began recruiting younger and younger and younger. In fact, later reports would come out that the Allies would capture troops as, on, from the German side as young as eight years old. I mean, they just really, really threw in, I mean, last-ditch effort. We're going to grab everybody we can. And, and they launched one final offensive, and it completely caught the Allied forces off guard. They were completely unprepared for it. They were celebrating. The war was already won in their minds, and they were not ready for the assault that would later be known as the Battle of the Bulge. And the Battle of the Bulge raged on for a period of about six weeks. It was uh, effectively the bloodiest battle for the Americans in all of World War II. In the six weeks of fighting that took place, we lost nearly 90,000 men, 90,000 casualties, 19,000 of which were fatalities. It was the bloodiest battle for the Americans. The Germans lost similar numbers. And ultimately, the Allies did prevail in that battle, but the cost was extremely high, in large part because they had written off the enemy as already defeated, and they were caught off guard. They certainly weren't home by Christmas like everybody thought they would be. The battle would rage on, or the war would rage on another six months before finally Germany was defeated, but not before thousands more were killed or maimed in the battle. Just like Germany was a defeated enemy, I've got some good news. Satan is a defeated enemy, okay? It is a foregone conclusion, okay? We win. I've read the end of the book, okay? We win. The battle, he's toast. However, there's just a little problem. 
somebody forgot to inform the devil. And he's still fighting, even though it's a foregone conclusion that ultimately will win. He is still fighting. The battle is still raging, evidenced by the fact that when I said, how many know we're in a battle, all of you pretty much were like, yep, in that battle, right? He is still coming after us. And if we're not careful, if we don't keep our guard up, up, we run the risk that the allies experienced in the Battle of the Bulge, that Satan will catch us off guard, he'll catch us unprepared, He's going to continue to fight, and we're going to find ourselves unexpectedly under fire, and the consequences could be very painful. And so that's really why we want to to launch into this series, The Fight, okay? Because God, in His grace to us, has given us all the tools we need to win this fight. Aren't you thankful for that? He's given us all the tools we need to push the kingdom of darkness back, to, to continue to press forward to also stand defensively so that when the enemy attacks us we can stand our ground and that's really what we want to talk about more specifically this morning is how do we stand our ground right how do we stand our ground when the enemy launches his attacks ephesians chapter 6 if you have your bibles and you may honestly want to just permanently mark ephesians chapter 6 because we're going to spend a lot of time in ephesians 6 over the next few weeks okay but ephesians 6 verse 10 says this Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have, you have equipped us, you've empowered us, you've given us all the tools we need to stand. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge so often it feels so difficult. And so, God, as we launch into this, this new series here this morning, God, I pray that you would remind us, God, of just how powerful you've made us to be, God, that you would remind us as soldiers in your army, God, that you have called us not to retreat, but God, to advance. God, that you've called us to stand our ground when the enemy brings on the assault. And so God, empower us in this way today. Be glorified, I pray. And Lord, help me to communicate to these people, God, everything that you want to communicate here today. In Jesus' name, amen. How many want to stand your ground? How many would rather just fall and give up? (laughs) Please don't raise your hand. (laughs) We want to stand our ground. Of course we want to stand our ground. But the reality is, is that even though we have every intention of standing, oftentimes it is difficult to stand our ground. And and along the way, we get knocked on our can, and it can be difficult to get back up. We want to stand our ground. God's given us every provision to stand our ground our ground. And in fact, more than you want to stand your ground, God wants you to stand your ground, right? That's why he's, he's given us everything that he's given us to stand our ground. And yet so many Christians are not. And so this morning we're going we're gonna to talk about three reasons that Christians in the church are not standing their ground for the Lord. Number one, you're fighting with the wrong power. You're fighting the battle with the wrong power. Let me reread verse 10. Finally, be strong in Ryan Conrad and in his mighty power. Ah, yeah, thank you. (laughs) He says you better preach it right. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Can I just say something that is so crucial to remember as it pertains to this spiritual battle? Are you ready for this? The Lord is strong. You're not. I don't care how great you think you are. When it comes to spiritual battle, the Lord is strong and we are... Now you say, well, that doesn't sound very nice, Pastor Ryan. You're calling me a weakling? Well, you know, sorry. Not sorry. Like, that's just just how it is. And anybody who has tried to fight the fight against the devil on their own will attest to this. It doesn't work, right? If you try and fight this on your own strength, you're going to fail, 
Scripture tells us over and over and over and over and over again, confirms us over and over and over again, that on our own strength, we're going to fall short against this enemy because he's just too skilled. In fact, can I tell you what confirms this? You've already fallen short, right? How many would admit, yeah, I tried to fight it on my own, didn't work, right? Didn't work. I fell short. Jeremiah chapter 12 is uh, it's an interesting chapter. Uh, Jeremiah, he's a pro, you know, prophet. He, he's complaining to God. He, he just is being real, real with God. And, and, and the gist of it, he's kind of basically saying like, hey, God, like here's the deal. Uh, I'm in a battle. This is really tough. Life is hard right now. And God, I don't get it because the wicked people, it seems like they're succeeding and they're prevailing and they're, they're like defeating me. And this isn't right. Basically, he says, hey, God, what's the deal here? Like, what, what, what is going on here? What are you doing? And so God's response is just so interesting to me. After Jeremiah kind of airs his complaint, God says this. He says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? In other words, God's saying, listen, buddy, you think that this is tough? You think that this battle you're in is, is rough? You just wait, because it's going to get worse, not better. And if this situation, which is relatively easy compared to what's coming, if this has worn you out, then you had better, better get your heads on straight here, because it's going to get even harder. And so confession time, how many would be brave enough to admit, my strength is not enough? Okay, my strength is not enough. I'm admitting it. My strength is not enough enough. The Apostle Paul, he said the same thing, 2 Corinthians 12. He said, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is, is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The moment that we start putting our hope in our own strength, we are in trouble. Okay? And I think pretty much all of us get that here. We understand that up here, but the way that we live our life reflects a, a different pattern, right? Because what tends to happen is, okay, we're feeling weak, life is difficult, and so we cry out to God, right? We saw this in our country, uh, if you think back to like to 9-11, for example, right? Oh my goodness, we were calling out to God at 9-11 because we felt shaken. That lasted about a few weeks, right? And then, oh, we got things under control, and we stopped crying out to God. And we do this personally, right? That, that, that life is tough, and so, God, I need your help. I'm feeling weak. And he gives us strength, and he help, helps us. But then what happens? At some point, we start to feel like pretty good about the situation. Oh, I'm feeling better. I feel like I got control. Okay, God, I got it. And we take the wheel back, right? We take control back, right? And we try and, and, try and go on our own strength again. Guess what? That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. That's what he's hoping you will do because in your own strength, you can't beat him. You need God's strength. See, I think there's something that we, we need to remember uh, about the devil, okay? And it's, and it's just this. It, when it comes down to your strength versus Satan's strength, guess who's going to win? Who knows who will win that fight? Satan's going to win that fight when it comes to your strength versus Satan's strength. He'll, he'll kick your butt every time. He will lick you every single time. Isaiah 10 uh, describes him a little bit. It says, how, have, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly and on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most Hi, the context of this is actually Satan's ultimate defeat, but it gives us a, a, a perspective of who he is, right? That he's been around a lot longer than you have. He knows a lot more than you do, okay? 
he was, is powerful enough that he at least got the illusion, he got the idea that he could overtake God. Okay, Now, he was mistaken about that, but, he, but he, he was powerful enough that he looked at the situation and said, you know, maybe I could overtake God. Maybe I could become God. And so he must be pretty powerful if that's the case. And by the way, he's invisible. He has his demonic minions working for him everywhere. He's a master of deception. And he's got it in for you. He wants to take you down. That's what he brings to the table in this fight. What do you bring to the table in your own strength? Uh, well, I did like 20 pull-ups one time in Viag class. <laughs> you know, got mostly like A's and B's in school. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm really good at like listing off statistics off the backs of baseball cards. And uh, I, can, I can remember just about every character in the Star Wars encyclopedia, if you ask me. I, I, I got nothing. I got nothing to bring to the table in this fight. He's going to kick my butt every time. If it, if it comes down to his strength versus my strength, I'm going to lose. Okay? That's why we need our strength to be the Lord. Ephesians 6.10, which we read, remember what it says? It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That statement, be strong in the Lord, when you really, when you really dig into what it means, what it's, what it's communicating is this, receive the impartation of the Lord's ability. Okay, That's what we're being invited to do, to receive the impartation of the Lord's ability. So let me ask you, do you want to fight this battle with your ability or with God's ability? How many want to fight this battle with your ability? Good, no hands. There was actually one hand that went up in, in first service, but I think it was a mistake. How many want to fight this battle with God's ability, right? We need the Lord's ability to fight this battle. Listen to what Jesus says in, in uh, Luke chapter 10. He had just sent out his, the 72 followers, and he, he sent them out. He said, I want you to go out there, and you're going to preach in my name, and you're going out with my authority and, and the power of my name. And here's what, here's what happens, Luke, Luke 10 says the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. You want to win this fight? Then you've got to fight with the strength of the one who has given you the authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. All the power. It doesn't matter what he throws at you. God has made you and equipped you and empowered you to overcome anything he can throw your way. When we fight with the right power, okay? And so that's number one. We got to fight with the right power. Stop fighting with the wrong power. Number two, we've got to stop wearing the wrong armor, okay? Stop wearing the wrong armor. Verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of who? Oh, like two people can read. Come on, let's do better. Put on the full armor of who? God, thank you. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God, okay? Not the full armor of Wells Fargo or U.S. Bank or your bank account, right? Not the full armor of your own personal charisma. Not the full armor of physical fitness. Not the full armor of a great marriage or a strong family. Okay? Not the full armor of your own intellect. All of those things on a surface level are great. Right? Nothing wrong with being smart. Nothing wrong with having a strong bank account, great family, healthy marriage, physical fit. All those things are good. But if we're relying on those things to bulletproof our life against the attacks of the enemy, guess what? Satan is going to find the chinks in those armor every time. He's going to identify the weaknesses and he's going to rip you to shreds. Okay, we've got to go into battle wearing the right armor, which is what we're going to learn about in the, in the coming weeks in this series. What are those different pieces of armor? Remember when David went out into battle against Goliath? And, uh, you know, it's interesting. So I think probably most of you are familiar with the, the story. Goliath is taunting the Israelites, right? This whole process goes on. David shows up on the scene, and he's like, why are you guys putting up with this? I'll go fight this guy, just this, you know, this young boy, right? And so finally, King Saul agrees to it. He's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll I guess you're willing to do it. We'll, we'll do it. And so this, look at what happens, though. Right after seeing, uh, King Saul agrees to this, 
Verse 38 of uh, 1 Samuel 17. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I am sure on the surface this looked really wise, right? Like, hey, David, you're going to go out and fight this giant. So tell you what, you can't go out there naked. So we're going to give you some armor. And we're not just going to give you any old raggedy discount armor. We're going to give you the king's armor. So this is like the top of the line stuff, right? Like the best armor. We're going to give it to you. And that way when you go out there, you're protected. I'm sure that looked really wise on a surface level. But here's the thing. If you, if you know much about that, that story, that portion of the Bible, King Saul, the Bible says, was a head taller than anybody else in Israel. He was huge. He was a big man. Okay, David is just a boy. So, I mean, as, I don't know if anybody, has, has anybody ever had your kids put on adult clothing, right? You know how silly they look like wearing an adult t-shirt or wearing, you know, like your little toddler walking around in like full-size adult shoes. They look ridiculous. Like it's funny, it's cute, whatever. But in battle, that wouldn't work, right? Because you would get so hung up on all the oversized armor. If David had gone out there in Saul's armor, he would have been dead in a matter of moments, He could not have gone out there and succeeded in that oversized armor. I'm sure it would have made him look like more of a warrior, but it would have ultimately gotten in his way. And so what did David do? He said, I can't go out there like this. I can't go out there in Saul's armor. I need to go out there in God's armor. And so he went into the battle uh, trusting that the Lord would be his strength, but also that the Lord would be his shield, that God would protect him. It's actually something we see David believe he really believed in this concept. You read through the Psalms, and dozens of times in the Psalms, David writes the phrase, the Lord is my shield. Psalm 28, 7, just one example. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. David's defense wasn't in Saul's armor. It was in God as his shield. Lord, you're going to have to protect me. And guess what? God did protect him in more ways than one. Okay, remember what Goliath did when David got out there? Now the battle's going to start, right? And what does Goliath do? 1 Samuel 17, 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. One of the things that God protected David from, really in that situation, was the verbal assault of Goliath. Because I want you to to just envision this. I want you to put yourself in David's shoes. Now this giant, who's twice as tall as you, they say nine feet tall, huge man is out there, right? And he starts bombarding you with insults and bombarding you with all of these these comments that are meant to discourage you, right? He's posturing. He's trying to, to, to taunt you, right? And it would have been really easy you know, for David in that situation to step out there. You know, I had faith when I was back in Saul's tent evaluating the situation and thinking I could go out there. But now that I'm out here, well, he looks a lot taller in person than he does on TV, right? Like he looks a lot bigger when he's up close than he does across the, the battle lines. And did you, hear, did you guys hear what he said he was going to do? He's going to feed me to the birds. He's going he's gonna to rip me to shreds. And it would have been really easy for David to lose faith in that moment, right? And to, and to chicken out, to wimp out and to back away and say, you know, on second thought, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm not ready to fight this fight. Do you know it's oftentimes when the greatest breakthrough is about to happen that the fight rages the hardest? It really is. But the greatest breakthroughs are oftentimes right on the verge of also some of the greatest fighting that, that has taken place in our life. And God just wanted to shield David And really, he shielded him from that so that those verbal uh, bullets that were being launched his way didn't didn't find their mark, right? Because David, he never wavered in his faith. What did he do? We read it here, verse 45. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. You know what he didn't say? He didn't go out there and say, 
Listen here, Goliath. Give me your best shot because I've got Saul's armor on. I've got the armor of the king, and you can't take me. That's not what he said. He said, I'm going out here in the Lord's strength. Goliath, give me your best shot. I come at you in the name of of the Lord, and he is my strength, and he is my shield, and anything you can try and throw at me, you know what? He is going to give me the victory, and then David pulled out a playground kind of a thing. Remember in the playground days when you were in elementary school, you probably said this, there was the little taunt, somebody would be making fun of you, and what was the response? I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say to me bounces off of me, and it sticks to you. How many ever said that? Okay, a few people, yeah. That's just what David does. He gives him a playground town. He's like, listen here, Goliath. I don't care what you say, okay? You can say whatever you want. I'm like, I got this, the shield of the Lord. It just bounces off of me like rubber, man, and it's going to stick to you, and whatever you pronounce on me, that's exactly what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to come over there, and I'm going to cut your head off with your own stinking sword. That's exactly what he does. Pulls out his sling, pulls out his little rock, whoosh, whoosh, pop, knocks Goliath down, busts out Goliath's sword and hacks his head off. Puffs out his chest and probably stands on top of him too, right? He takes him down because he went out there in the Lord's strength, but also with the Lord as his shield. God was his armor. You want to you stand your ground? Because the enemy is going to launch verbal assaults at you. He's going to bombard you with lies, just like Goliath bombarded David with lies. He's going to try and discourage you and defeat you before the battle really starts, right? He just pummels us. If you want to stand your ground against that, yes, we need the right strength and we need to fight in the right power, but we also need to, to be equipped with the right armor. God is our shield. He is our defense. So stop fighting with the wrong power. Stop fighting with the wrong armor on or wearing the wrong armor. Number three, last one. Stop fighting the wrong enemy. You're fighting the wrong enemy, right? What, is the, what, is, what does Paul say in verse 12 of, Ephes- of Ephesians 6? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do me a favor. Pinch your neighbor and say, to them, your fight is not against this. Come on, do it. Grab a neighbor, pinch him, and say, your fight is not against this. Your fight is not against flesh and blood. Your fight is not against another person. And I think if we're honest, we're probably all susceptible to this one, right? That we try and put the fight with with the people around us, the flesh and blood around us, when the real fight is supposed to be with our common enemy, Satan, Right? And Satan loves it when we do this because he knows if he can get us fighting against one another, right, it's all the less energy we have to fight him with. Right? If we can divide one another or be divided against one another, we'll never succeed in our fight against him. That's, that, he knows we're much weaker when we're alone than we are when we're unified together. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, Though one may be overpowered, Two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. When we remain united together, how many know we're so much stronger when when we're united, when we're working together versus when we're fighting amongst ourselves and then trying to fight the battle with the devil at the same time, right? We're so much stronger when we are together. Now, let let me just illustrate this for you in maybe kind of a little bit of a negative way, just a lesson I had to learn somewhere along the way. When I was a teenager many years ago, I used to like to play paintball. Any, play, any uh, paintballers in the house? A couple, okay. So I don't have a paintball gun here today, but I do have this. And as a teenager, I would, uh, we, we would go with our, our youth group, we'd go play some paintball. And uh, so this one particular time that I'm thinking of, we, we had this plan, our team had this plan. We were going to send four guys over to this little part of the woods, and we were going to set an ambush. And when the other team came along to try and capture our flag, we were going to wait to the last possible second. We were going to spring up, and we were going to unload all of our paintballs on them, and we were going to win. That was our our plan. But if you know much about strategy, an ambush needs to be kind of quiet, right? It needs to remain kind of quiet. So there were four guys on on our little group here. There was myself, there was two really good buddies, and there was this fourth guy who was the biggest guy in our youth group. And I don't mean like football player big guy. I mean like awkward, clumsy big guy, 
Like just he was he was just you know he's just at that awkward phase of teenage life where like his body was just just growing in weird ways and he was super tall and kind of a bigger guy and just like stumbled all over himself and his name actually happened to be Ryan as well but it was not me I'm not like deferring that to some like it was another guy named Ryan really okay and so <clears throat> that that was our little four man squad that was gonna conduct the ambush and so there was the three of us and the clumsy guy and the clumsy guy was making all kinds of noise. I mean, he was thrashing around in the brush, and, and he was talking loud, and it was like, dude, Ryan, shh, you got to be quiet. They're going to know where we're at. You've got to be silent. And he's thrashing around some more and just making all kinds of racket, and we're just getting irritated beyond belief. And so finally, I said, Ryan, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to shoot you myself, <laughs> and you're going to be out of this game. I lean over my buddy, I go, he is going to get us all shot. We got to get him out of here. He's wrecking our plan. And so he continued to make some noise. And so I shot him. My own teammate. Now, in retrospect, that was a really dumb thing to do. Because when I fired my weapon, it gave away our position, so our ambush was ruined. Okay? I made my teammate mad. I knocked him out of the game, because that was the rules. He had been shot. He had to leave the game. So now when the enemy came to take our position, guess what I had done? I had just eliminated one of our guns that was there to try and win the battle. I had taken out my own teammate out of my own irritation with the way that he was behaving. Now move it from the paintball field and let's bring it to real life. Because friends, I got to tell you, we spend an awful lot of time shooting at one another, don't we? A lot of times here in the church, we love to shoot at other Christians because I still got one shot left for somebody who's misbehaving. Because here's what happens. Somebody rubs us the wrong way or somebody's a little different than we are or somebody offends us or somebody, you know, just, just, oh, they do something that we feel is wrong. And what do we do? Instead of praying for them, instead of building them up, instead of unifying and linking arms with them, instead of taking on the same common enemy that we have, we turn our battle inward. And we, and we do things like we gossip behind their back, or we slander them, or we tell them off because we're justified in giving that person a piece of our mind, Right? And, and we bring the battle to the flesh and blood. But what does Paul say? He says, your battle is not with the flesh and blood. Your battle is with all of these spiritual forces that are going around, on around you. So what if we stop shooting at each other, right? And what if we stop taking each other out? Because how many recognize when I take out my brothers and sisters in the body, all I've succeeded in doing is weakening the body, Right? And now we're less effective. And me, all the while, Satan just sits back and I think he just laughs. Like, look at, I'm making you guys fight one another. And now when it's time to fight me, you're not going to have any strength left or any, any energy left. And you're not going to have, you know, people side by side with you to fight this battle. You're going to do it alone. And I think he just laughs, which is why, church, it's so important that we walk in some of the stuff I talked about last weekend, that Colossians chapter three, you know, the forgiveness and the grace and humility, right? And gentleness and kindness, right? That we, that we operate in that, in that Colossians three clothing that God wants to outfit us with, right? That we, that we interact with one another with these things. Why? Because the devil wants to divide us and we've got to resist the urge to let him succeed at that. In second Corinthians uh, chapter two, there's a situation that we kind of kind of read about. Let me read this verse, and I'll, I'll just quickly explain what's going on here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2 says, And what I have forgiven, this is Paul, what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. There was a real unhealthy situation in the Corinthian church that you can read about in 1 Corinthians, in, in his letter to uh, Corinthians, the first one. And the gist of it, the short version, there was a man who was sleeping with his stepmother. Okay, it was really unhealthy. It was very dysfunctional. 
and there was discipline that was required. In fact, this guy had to be excommunicated from the church because he was, he was unrepentant about what he had done. And that you can read all about that in 1 Corinthians. But now 2 Corinthians is written, and Paul says, all right, here's the deal. We need to restore this guy. Like the punishment has been handed out. The situation has been resolved. There's been repentance. He's forgiven. Now we need to restore him. And here's why. Because if this situation is allowed to linger, if this fight stays going on amongst this body, Satan is going to outwit us. Satan is going to use that as an opportunity to divide us. We know how he works. We know his schemes. We're aware of his schemes. And so here's what we need to do. We need to forgive this guy, stop talking bad about him, stop slandering him, stop you know, keeping him at arm's distance, and we need to restore him and forgive him, and we need to move on. Okay? And, that's, and that is exactly what some of us need to do with another brother or sister in Christ. We need to look at that situation and say, you know, I, such and such a thing happened, and maybe it was painful, maybe it was hard, maybe it was hurtful. I'm not trying to minimize that. But if we continue to allow that to linger within the body, what's going to happen? Satan's going to use it to divide us. And when, he, we're, when we're divided, we're not nearly as strong as when we are united. As the musicians come this morning, some of us this morning, we need to adjust our aim. We need to stop shooting at the Christians around us and start focusing on the real enemy. We need to unify together. And when we, when we do that, we become an unstoppable force. You know, I mentioned some World War II stuff earlier on. It's interesting. You, you know, it's hard for us to remember this, I think, because so many years later, America is like the military superpower. But at the dawn of World War II, the United States was not the superpower. Germany was. Germany was the most powerful army. In fact, all of these different countries that tried to take Germany on alone, Germany was kicking their butts. And if we had tried to take on Germany alone, Germany would have kicked our butt. Okay? That, they were just that far superior. Guess when the tide of the war turned? When we came together. When we, when we became allies. And you know what that meant? It's interesting, without getting too much into the history, one of our allies was Russia. I mean, think about that. Soviet Union. Think about that. I mean, we're pretty different than them. We don't always understand them. We don't get along with them. But for the sake of defeating a common enemy that they were also fighting, what did we do? We linked arms with somebody that maybe we didn't understand all that well. And, and you know, and then the whole Cold War thing and that all happened too. But, but during World War II, we were allies. We were allies with England. Remember who we fought the American Revolution against? Pretty sure that was England. We might have had to forgive some stuff from the past to link arms with somebody that was once our enemy and to link arms and to take on the common enemy. And when we did that, that's when the tide of the war turned and Germany, as powerful as they were, couldn't stand against all of us working together. The devil cannot stand against a united church, but he has no problem taking us out when we try and fight this fight alone. This morning... Every head bowed, every eye closed. What's preventing you from standing your ground? We need to stop fighting the wrong enemy, wearing the wrong armor, fighting with the wrong power. And, and, and perhaps some of us, maybe all of us to some degree, are, are, are guilty of one or more of those things. We've been, re been reliant on the wrong source of strength. You've been trying to fight with your strength instead of God's. Maybe you've been going into battle reliant on the wrong armor, and it's time to let God become your shield. Maybe you've been one of those, you've been fighting the wrong enemy. Satan would love nothing more for you to do that, and it's time for you to bring the battle back where it belongs to the real enemy and to stop fighting the wrong enemy. And what I want to do this morning, I just want, I just want to just pray over us because we're all in the battle. We acknowledge that we're all in the battle. And so my prayer this morning, Lord, is this. God, that we would be a people that stand our ground. God, I know that that's the intention everybody here has. God, I know that that's the heart desire of every person in this room. God, we don't want to be defeated. God, we want to stand our ground. And so, God, we thank you that you have given us tools to do that with. But, God, we've got to turn our attention to the right enemy. God, we've got to fight with the right power. God, we've got to walk protected by the right armor. And God, some of us 
uh, this morning, we're not doing that. And so, God, I pray that this week, God, as, we, as the battle rages, and God, we know it's going, it's going to rage on around us. God, there's going to be moments when, when the enemy tries to knock us down, tries to taunt us, tries to assault us, tries to discourage us. God, I pray that this week would be different for those who have maybe, maybe they've been in retreat mode. Maybe they've been running from the enemy. How silly to run from a defeated enemy. God, we're thankful. We know that we are victorious. We know that we win. But Lord, we also know the enemy is going to fight down to the last moment. And so God, help us to not retreat from him. He's defeated. God, help us to walk in the victory you've already paid for. God, and to to fight not for victory, but to fight from victory. God, to walk in that victory, I pray. God, help us to stand our ground. God, help us to stop firing bullets at one another. Lord, to link arms and to press forward against the common enemy we have. God, we love you. Give us great success on the battlefield of, of, of our spiritual life this week, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hey, thank you so much for coming out on a rainy morning and braving some windy, inclement weather. You you made it here. Thank you for being here. I hope that it was worth your time this morning. Hope you feel like uh, energized and recharged. Praying that you have a great week. Don't forget we've got our prayer meeting in our home tonight. We'd love to see you there. Otherwise, have an awesome week. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you, church.